Hey people, how are you doing? Welcome to the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Uh, we are going live as always on Tuesday nights on our YouTube channel. So if you are listening to the podcast and you'd like to join us, then just head along to the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel at eight o'clock on every Tuesday. And it's been every Tuesday for the last 135 weeks, pretty much. Um, so, but if you listen to the podcast, then that's fantastic as well. If you could leave a review and a rating, that'd be even nicer because it just helps us appear more consistently and higher up in the Google search, which is what it's all about. It's all about getting the great word of our special guests out there to more people. So thanks for listening, but do try and leave us a review. Right. So tonight it's the first episode of a new regular series called Ask Tim, which I've had great fun pushing on TikTok and doing videos and including lovely photos and things spinning around. Um, and it's with Tim Allardyce, who I'm hoping uh, some of you listening uh, to the podcast, 2,600 or so listeners are not aware of. Tim is probably best known as the founder of Rehab My Patient Clinical Software. With an awful lot of clinicians, sports therapists, physios, chiros, osteos, and use in their clinics, but is also group clinical director and NHS England clinical entrepreneur and a generally all round nice bloke. So it's an absolute pleasure to be launching this series where we're basically, or well, Tim has agreed to sit on the hot seat and ask questions which I have been receiving over the last week from you guys. Um, if you do want to send questions in for uh, next episode, then just send them to matt at the sta.co.uk. Bear in mind that the episode is the first Tuesday of the month. So send them in and we'll, as long as they're decent and they're not going to make him feel compromised at all, then we'll put, we'll give them to Tim and ask Tim episode two. Anyway, so the rest of February after tonight will be a focus on mental health and learning disability. We've got some fantastic guests lined up for you on February the 14th, which will be episode 136. We have James Chapman, who's no stranger to the show. James Chapman is from the website allaboutthemind.com, an instructor for MHFA, which is Mental Health First Aid. He spoke at our therapy expo um, in November, really well received, lovely educator and speaker. Uh, so I do recommend that you come and join us on February the 14th if you want to join us live. The week after, on February the 21st, in episode 137, we have Alistair Beverly of ldphysio.com, which stands for Learning Disability. Um, Alistair, again, spoke at Therapy Expo, fantastic individual. He's worked as Team GB Physiotherapist for Special Olympics, Great Britain, and Clinical Director for Health and Wellbeing. An amazing educator when it comes to highlighting health inequality for people with learning and communication disabilities in mainstream healthcare services. I recommend that before that you follow Alistair Beverly somewhere. He's very active on Twitter, on Instagram, even on TikTok. I've had great pleasure in finding someone on TikTok that's not dancing or taking their clothes off. It's taken me a long time, but Alistair doesn't do it yet. But really amazing information of what to bear in mind if you do get somebody coming in with Down syndrome or one of the other learning disabilities or communication um, uh, disabilities of some form. What do you do? What do you need to know? And also about making sure that you are not thinking that the symptoms they're feeling are part of their disability and overseeing um, a normal clinical analysis that you'd be doing. Um, so that's that's a really important thing which we'll be talking about as well. So I'm really looking forward to that episode um, with Alistair Beverly. Then on February the 28th, in episode 138, it will be Ryan Smith and Jack Coward. Um, Ryan Smith, a lot of you from the STA will be aware of because he's an STA rep, but Ryan and Jack are also creators and hosts of Let's Be Frank podcast, which is a mental health awareness podcast that gives men a platform and a safe space where they can stand up and speak out about their life struggles and mental health challenges. It's going to be um, an emotionally great month of education for soft tissue therapists out there talking about topics and considerations which we need to and we probably weren't taught on our various courses uh, whether a degree or not so yeah do catch up with this either live on tuesdays on the sports therapy association podcast our youtube channel or like i say it'll be available on all popular podcast apps great month is going to be anyway back to tonight's episode the first of our new first tuesday of the month series ask tim with Tim Allardyce. We have Tim Allardyce, I'll bring him up shortly, and also Gary Benson, founder of the STA, is joining us as well. Uh, people in the live lounge, thanks for joining us as well, making this so special. Um, if you guys have some comments, I've got eight questions sorted out now, which is more than enough, I think, for tonight's hour. 
but if you want to make comments obviously on Tim's answers or add some um, personal experience or comments then then please do use the live lounge as much as you like um, and when people do so you know if you listen to the podcast I can bring them up here on the screen um, for example Glenn Murphy says hello baby it's the big bopper calling you can see the kind of clientele we get here in the STA podcast hey Glenn thanks for joining us really nice to see see you uh, nikki mansfield is here bringing up her comment on the screen bonsoir to le monde looking forward to some interesting chat and expert insights tonight thanks nikki great for joining us also brian huxley is here lindsay penn is here leslie campbell is here um leslie campbell says such great chats and cpd matt exclamation mark such a great resource had a client who had childhood dysplasia so we could engage with that and also run out with butt pain last week so yeah the reason leslie's sharing this with me is because last week was last month was all about hip issues and hip dysplasia with holly sober doyle and we talked with sarah rollins dr sarah rollins and Eva acton some amazing episodes all available but they've been waiting in the lobby for long enough so i will now bring up Tim Allardyce and Gary Benson. Hey Tim, how are you doing? Are you muted, Tim? I think you've muted. I hope you're muted and we can change I'm that. I'm doing name. good, how are there you? There we go. <laughs> I was so worried in my heart. I still haven't around. worried it out after two, three years of using <laughs> Zoom calls and Teams calls and, and, and live podcasts. I still haven't worked out just to unclick the mute button. No problem at all. It's endearing. It's fine. And Gary, how are you doing, Gary? Yeah, fine. Thank you, Matt. Smashing. Right. So I've been so excited this week taking questions. And thank you, Tim, for basically just setting yourself up. You haven't heard any of these questions at all. I know you're a very experienced guy with probably, I think, 17 plus years, is it, in healthcare? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, 23, 23 years now. Yeah. 23, oh 17, as a, 17 as a physio. Um, okay. 18 as a physio 23 yeah wow what were you doing before physiotherapy uh osteopath oh of course yeah yeah, yeah of course i thought i thought you were going to yeah. say you taught les mills exercise yeah. classes or something but yeah osteopath before yeah physiotherapy. and then wow. i was doing some sort of rehab therapy before that at, uh, for a couple of years before that you look so well fit people listen to podcasts can't it's see this it's, fresh, the, it's young. the camera it hasn't it, it's, it's got a good angle it's um the lighting's good but if you get up close you'll see some uh you'll see some aged wrinkles there that's a good filter you use man very good filter the power these days yeah uh, most people know you for being the uh, founder or creator of um we have my patient um yeah. but you don't really i mean that's an amazing platform and and obviously very proud of it but you that that would be not fair just to let you know for that. You don't want that to be your legacy, do you? You do a lot more as well. In fact, you've had done some things recently. I think I saw a congratulations is in order, isn't it? You've done some other project? Uh, well, I, 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 I do a few bits and pieces here and there. I mean, um, you know, they range from um, working to stay in an NHS long COVID clinic to open new physio clinic um, in Ballum to, um, to been writing a book which I'm not yet published but I'm sort of about 90% free um so yeah I do all sorts of things from you know from from oh I mean it's, it's just so wide I do sport and I do NHS and I do private stuff and, and, and I do software and so I, I get my turn yeah. to do things um we have my patients actually fairly small um it's still I mean it you know we have quite a few users but it's not massive mm -hmm. um you know we still run it with a fairly small team um and yeah um so i'll do a few bits, bits and pieces what was the long covid thing i think that's what i saw recently you dropped my memory it, it's to do with you've got a grant or something for research or you've got a team you're putting together or something uh, yeah we, we didn't get a grant or anything like that but i've, I've just literally agreed to step in and oh, and just... basically look after a long covid clinic they were really really struggling for staff um so it's a long covid clinic in lewisham um and i had you know a few patients come in today with long covid but one or two of them were very challenging Mm -hmm. um, but I've, I've been really, you know, really enjoying it and it's been a real eye opener. Um, it's really sad in some some cases and I'm happy to tell you some stories about that or if anyone's interested to talk a bit about it. I'm actually doing a, a talk for the um, for a, a conference in, um, in, 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 in Northern Essex um, in a month's time on, on and I'm presenting on long COVID and some of my findings from working in long COVID clinic. But oh. it's been really interesting. I love just to immerse myself in different things. I really believe it's about just living life to the full, you know, just do, doing, doing, I, I just say, say doing cool shit, excuse my language, but just doing different it's things. Okay. And, and um, I hope that's okay to use the S word. 
Oh, that's fine. Yeah, you know, doctor, like I say, Dr. Sarah Collins um, said to presidents last week uh, from a doctor as well, from a GP. But anyway, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Wow. So we can see So we can oh, see immediately fun. why you're on the chair. This is fantastic. You do so much. You've got so much experience and you've helped so many therapists. We've had you on the STA podcast a number of times for that reason. And I'm actually I would we'll talk another time. But I would like to do um, a few episodes on long COVID. I think people are kind of forgetting about it or getting misinformation. Um, and I, I'm keeping in contact with a couple of people that are suffering from it and having, you know, um, tests and things still done, still very much living terrible, terribly challenging lives. Terrible. Because something, of it. Yeah, it's going yeah. really, really bad. Yeah. I so, yeah, we'll do that coming up. We'll do something about that. That'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That'd be cool. Gary, how are you? How's things at the STA? Yes, very well. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm, I'm well. Um, but it's interesting to hear about long COVID because... Uh, uh, as, as you may remember, I'm still undergoing tests. I had COVID last year um, and I've had to have some testing done. I had a, a you know, ultrasound scan last month, I think. Um, but yeah, there's some, uh, I, I'm even having genetic testing done now for some problems that I'm having. Um, but it, it's all come about since COVID, really. Um, so I'd be interested to listen to the long COVID stuff. We'll definitely get something sorted for that. Definitely. Um, Nikki Mansfield says, I'd love to hear more about long COVID stuff. A whole podcast episode. Yeah, I reckon we'll do two or three. We might even do a month on it. I think there's enough. Definitely get hold of four experts. We've already got one. Um, I've got somebody, an uh, STA member who is dealing with it, who I believe would be happy to share experiences as well. So that's two. I'm sure we'll find a couple other people. So yeah, I think it's worth it. Um, it's not all done and finished now. It wasn't just a, especially, oh, I don't want to go into it. Some of the things I read on social media. Where it was still a con and never really happened it was just a common cold and you're thinking oh mate really <laughs> if you could walk down one room of patients suffering from the consequences you'd change your tune but anyway maybe i just listened to the wrong places tonight ask tim we've got some great questions lined up um i guess we'll just kind of crack on and go with it tim i'm so excited <laughs> i really am so uh we'll just bring them up uh, yeah sure okay yeah let's do it Okay, let's do it. Well, I'm going to bring one up for people listening to the podcast. You can't see, but I'm going to bring up kind of a summary on the screen and then I'll read out the actual email that came in. I'm not saying the names of the people who sent me the emails. I should probably specify in the future if you want your name mentioned, which would be a cool idea, then let me know in the email and I will say this is from so and so and so and so. But um, I haven't done that, so I won't be saying names tonight. Right then, so question one is up on the screen. Do, 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 do. Advice on room space clinic renting. So the whole question, um, Tim, was, yeah. can I have some advice, please, on room space clinic renting? I am rubbish at it. I hate negotiating. It makes me cringe. I never know whether to charge per hour or percent of the clients uh, to charge, even if they don't have any custom, because it gives newbies a step up. Yeah, so, so I think what the question is asking is, is renting out to other therapists within your own premises. Um, is that what you're reading about or are you thinking no, it's I think more about it, knowing, the, knowing the therapist i think they're struggling oh no actually it's not, i think, I, I think that's the case i think it. it's somebody wanting to rent out oh they've got a space and they want they've to rent got a out space and they're saying oh, you, you go. know should i take a percentage of 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 my therapist fees and i always feel awkward having that conversation yes that is the question you're right you're right, you're right. yeah you know i i mean uh, you know you, you will feel a bit awkward asking for, for but but it's a commercial relationship if you've got space, that space has a value. It doesn't matter whether it's land. It doesn't matter whether it's 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 a building. It could be a big building. It could be a small building. But all land has value, and and essentially it's an asset. And and assets need to generate revenue. Otherwise, they're not assets. They're liabilities. Um, and that's an important point because you have this great asset that needs to generate revenue to pay bills. There's electricity there's heating there's lighting there's 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 costs there's toilet paper there's carpet cleaning there's all these costs that you have to cover and so you need to think of it as a commercial relationship and you need to think what should that space um uh generate in revenue for me you know if it was a room in in most parts of london you'd probably be looking at a minimum of you know 900 pounds a month to rent out and obviously, the further you go outside of London, the cheaper that room will get. Uh, but that's the sort of figure you should be looking to to rent. So if someone comes along, I mean, we we have a lot of people that, that inquire about renting um, renting rooms from us. And we almost always say no um, for the fact that most people just want to rent it for a couple of hours 
once once every two weeks and that's just too much hassle to get 20 quid here and there it's not worth the hassle for us um, but i think if you if you do you know if the room's going empty and you don't mind dealing with people sort of that mess you around a little bit and ask for you know that that, that, that um just want an hour here there just put the put the fee up charge them a decent amount a typical hourly charge would be you know anywhere around 15 pounds possibly you know around 10 to 15 pounds an hour as room rentals about right um and that that figure that amount drops down with the more commitment they take um so treat it as a commercial relationship uh don't be afraid to ask for funds have everything agreed beforehand put it all out in an email or have a license agreement you can download license agreements off the internet if anybody wants a copy i've got one and i can share it with you just post it in here or send a send an email you know post your email and I'll, I'll send you a copy of my license agreement and um, it's a commercial relationship and i'll hand that over to gary because he's going to know about this stuff as well thanks tim yeah what, what i would say and looking at it from both perspective of therapists wanting to rent a room and therapists wanting to rent out their rooms um one of the first things is always have you know a, a get out clause in your contract or your license agreement because when we start off in business we may have expectations that, that we might not fulfill um, and therefore if you're stuck paying a rent for a year for example and you've only worked six months and you can't make a go of it then it's a liability that neither the clinic owner or the the therapist wants so have a review period um, what I've found successful in the past is pay if you're working on a commission basis paying a, a higher commission for the first 10 clients, less commission for the next 10 clients, and then a lower still commission for the for the next 10 clients. That gives me some incentive, if you like, to, to go and get more clients because I'm getting, in effect, better off because I'm not paying as much. But also, as well, the clinic owner is getting more income, um, you know, the more successful I am. But there are lots of variables, you know, who does the advertising, who does the cleaning, who sets the room up, who, who supplies the consumables, who provides reception services, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's also the HMRC employment status test that you can do online. You know, if you are going to have somebody in your clinic as a self-employed person, but you are taking the money and giving them a share of it, in effect, you may fail the self-employment status test on HMRC website. So my recommendation is have a trip over to their website, take the test, just find out exactly where you stand because increasing number of clinics are being found out on this. And, you know, for a clinic owner, it might be better if they have self-employed people come in because then they don't have the, you know, the holiday pay, the maternity pay, the sick pay, etc. But they may be falling short on their responsibilities. And that's what HMRC are pretty tight on at the moment. That's great. We'll make sure this is gonna be a lot of links I can tell from tonight's episode. We'll make sure that goes into the show notes, which you can see either at the sta.co.uk website, or go to Podbean. And also I end up putting on YouTube. But yeah, some amazing information there. And Nikki's jumped in with a question here. Uh, which I'll bring up onto the screen. Have you ever found a happy medium between the two extremes of percentage per client booked, good for therapists with few bookings, and flat rate, good for clinic owner? Back to you, Tim. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just prefer flat rate room rental. It's less hassle. It's less um, aggravation. It's less working out numbers at the end of the month. Um, it's less changing invoice and the billing. I just prefer to set up a stand, ask them to set up a standing order. It gets paid on the first of the month, you know, and it's easy to track. And, and you know, if they take more time, they, they standing order increases. I, I, I prefer that method. Uh, but yeah, you can do, um, of course, if you if you want to run a clinic and, and, and actually build your own client list and, and clinics client list. And of course, you can have therapists that are self-employed and that works really, really well. Um, so they take a percentage. Um, in my industry, it's typically 50%, but that, that varies. That might be slightly higher for massage therapy. Um, so you, you may go, need to go up to sort of 60% or 70% for massage therapy. Um, but for physiotherapy and osteopathy, it's 50% typically is, is a standard rate. Um, so the therapist takes their 50%. We take our 50%. We pay for the heating, the lighting, the toilet paper, the teas and coffees, etc. cetera. Um, and... Um, and, and often the receptionists. So yeah, 50-50, pros and cons of both. Um, think what works for you. If you're just renting a room to somebody, put it up on a standing order, make it easy for yourself rather than trying to 
get information on how many clients they've seen if they're not your clients. That's great. I mean, you give the trouble is, I think you mentioned this last time you were on, therapists generally are quite altruistic, nice people who want to, they're doing it for the thanks, not necessarily the money. So it's hard to make these cuts, not cuts, even I'm using a word, but it's hard to make these just business, simple ways of doing it, direct, uh, standing order, no kind of, oh, but I could do this for you and make this easy for you. It's It can be a downfall, can't it? So Yeah, it can be. And then it starts getting into, oh, do you want to do a therapy swap? And that's fine. But you know what, sometimes it's easiest just to have yeah. an agreement it's in writing it's a license agreement it's contractual they've got a notice period mm. every on the first of month every month they pay a certain amount comes into your bank account and that is that's really a, a great way to do it and that's how most pe property empires have been built just through standard subletting great idea great great advice thank you very much uh, thanks for the question as well nicky right we're going to move on um here we go. Question two. I put it up on the screen. How to get business in small villages. So the whole question was, how do you get businesses in little villages? They have so little footfall compared to a busy city. I'm doing more marketing now in my new little village than I ever did. But I've had far more business. Or I had far more business when I was in a big city. Tim. I mean, you, you, this there's it's there's pros and cons of both options, isn't there? So you know um, the upside of being in a city is there's lots and lots and lots of people so potentially lots and lots of business i was really lucky i set up my first clinic in croydon no one wanted to work in croydon when i set up i was one of the first main clinics that set up and um and you know everyone wanted to be in bromley next door and, and beckenham and you know even more, more affluent areas but no one wants to be in croydon in 2005 and uh croydon's got a population now of 415,000 people um, it's it's a massive borough and so it's, it was massively populated area and that really 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 helped um helped business so footfall is really important and population is really important but there are pros and cons you have less parking in the cities you have higher rents in the cities you have the, the the city environment you know it's more polluted and everybody's all more hustle bustle when you know when you go out in the country it is more remote, but you get, you know, you get the fields and you get the views and you get, you know, they get, you get the lifestyle out there. You know, it's easier parking out there. Premises are cheaper to buy out, out you know, out of the cities. Um, and so I think you've got to weigh up what, what works for you. Yes, it's going to be quieter, but you're going to have less costs. The rents are going to be lower. The rates are going to be lower. Everything's going to be lower. Even in London, the closer you get to London, the higher the rates are. You know, I've got a tiny premises in, in Ballam and the rates are £20,000 a year. I've got a premises in Mitcham, three miles down the road, and it's half the price. So I think then um, you just got to weigh up what works for you. Yes, it's quieter and you'll have to work hard on your marketing, but but there are less costs and, and, and there's a lifestyle advantage. Over to Gary. I live in a village. <laughs> Talking in little villages in loads of fields. Yeah, I've always segue. lived in villages. I've, my practice has always been village-based, but the marketing is totally different. In a city, I couldn't work in a city. I can't deal with the the hum, you know the hundreds of people, the, the the lack of parking, the hustle and bustle. I can't deal with that. But what I found is that in cities and towns, there's more competition. So. In a village environment, I think marketing has to be different. You can't simply put out services marketing. What you have to do is make a connection with the communities and things like, you know, going and giving a talk at your local WI, your local craft club, your local athletics club. You know, those are the things that pay off in a village. People want to see you walking around the village with your, your sports therapist, your soft tissue therapist, your sports massage therapist jacket on when you go in the local shop make that connection locally and become the go-to person. I had people traveling 60, 70 miles plus to see me in my village. You know, most of my clients came from the city, but that's because I was involved with the local cricket club. I was in love with the local golf club that was all city-based. So it is different, but if that's one of my members and you want to talk to me specifically about marketing in villages, drop me, drop STA Gary a message and I can spend half an hour going over the things that we need need to do fantastic um 
we've got a comment here maybe tester said i work in a small village word of mouth recommendations go further and local fb groups often allow advertising or people even ask for recommendations fb i've read somewhere i'm always trying to keep my head to the ground but fb community groups are supposed to be an amazing way um, to actually get business so many people are using facebook now in local groups you know and that seems to be is that am i fooling myself Tim or, one, or Gary? one thing I would say about local community groups, and we have a, a village one, is and 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 I there's there's somebody set up 15, 20 miles away from me who advertises weekly in every single local community group, even though they're not in that community. And a lot of people get fed up with seeing that. Yeah. You know, so I would say if you're in your local community group, by all means advertise, you know, tell them that the services that you're offering, tell them where you're based, you know, look out for the house with a with the yellow lights outside, for example. Really, you know, use those, but answer questions as well, because in the community, it's people might be saying, oh, does anybody know I've got I've had a bad, bad, does anybody know a chiropractor? And you might say, well, you know, I'm not a chiropractor, but I, I have a set of skills built up over a number of years, a little bit like Liam Neeson, you know, and um, and do it that way. But what community groups usually allow is you can update it once a week. So they don't want it in every day. But if you've got a business profile, put it in once a week. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, that's a good bit of advice. Yeah, you definitely don't want to think get the community thinking you're just there for the money because it'd be totally negative. Um, yeah. Tim, are you going to say something on Facebook groups or? okay yeah I, I remember going to speak to my local uh wi um in 2006 um i was invited by one of my patients and i went down there and and it was great actually i, I picked up i picked up you know one person from me i think there was about sort of 15 or 20 people there um and and that's what you've got to do you just get, you know like like these guys have said you, you know you've got to get in with the communities um and, and 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 that's less important i think in the cities because you, you've just got so many more people so i think uh can't really add anything more to that what what you usually find in villages as well is the people who are in the craft group and the hist local history group and the wi they're usually a little bit older they usually got disposable time and income especially during the day if you're working between your child's school hours um, and I, I tend to find it's a, a, a sort of a better client if you like a better um experience with them i did my uh, a talk at my local wi and i said to mom i said that's not really my demographic mom thank you very much she says well you know you're missing out because helen's the local crown green bowl champion you know such and such plays badminton for england and um such and such is a is an age group triathlete or cyclist so there are there are people in there and just going and giving a talk about you and and, and your experience and how you can facilitate change for them even if it's something as simple as balance training to reduce the risk of falls in you know in later life that kind of thing you will make a connection with the groups great advice really good um, and also we've got some marvelous uh, recommendations and advice coming from people in the live lounge keep it coming people if you listen to podcasts then it, sometimes it's worth or nearly always i'd say watch the youtube video if you if you want to see the comments and the suggestions and things coming up um and in a, and if you're in the uk then it's worth visiting along because you'll see people in your area you'll, it's a great way of networking so if you are listening to the podcast i would recommend that you come along at eight o'clock to the sports therapy association youtube channel and just hang out a little bit and it could be a good networking thing for yourself get some ideas and meet some people in your area all right we're moving on with the questions okay so let's bring the next one up i think we are on Question three. Okay, so this is a really interesting question. Um, I've put a summary here. Should we study more about psychology? I spelled it right. That's good. The question was, um, now we are aware that working with a person involves more than just the biomechanical. Should we be studying more about psychology, e.g. ACT, CBT, MI, hypnotherapy, and sociology? Should there be more of this in courses? Tim's smiling there. Like, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really great question. I'm smiling because um, because I I'm really keen on actually going back to university and doing a psychology degree. Okay. I've been looking at a masters in psychology. Um, yeah. They run a, you know, they run a, a full time one year course or two, a part time two year course, um, and it's fully remote. So I've been really, really, really tempted to do it, and I'm just a bit busy at the moment. So I've sort of thought I'll probably hold off, and and I might not ever do it. You know, it might just be one of those sort of crazy ideas that comes into your head, but 
and I, I think, you know, I think as, as therapists, we get, you know, as, as, as certainly as, as, as manual therapists, as, as, as soft tissue therapists, physios, et cetera, we, we get quite good with, with, with body stuff. And then there's this whole sort of mind aspect, this whole psyche and, 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 um, and, um, social aspect, uh, and, you know, and I think there is a real benefit to having the skills of, of, of psychology but of course this is a whole new profession and you're not psychologists we're not psychologists um and you know what i think when when we're with patients we're great at massaging and stretching and mobilizing and and and, and articulating and and rehabbing um and i often have a chat about patients how they're getting on with their life and how, how how's everything behind the scenes and you know work all right and managing stress levels okay but i think if you go beyond that and you start to cross into an an area where you know you, you, this is trained professionals deal with it i had a patient in today in my long covid clinic told me she was suicidal um, and that was a really uh, difficult thing to to hear she was really upset um but i didn't give her advice because this is a serious you know th this needs to be in the in the hands of of experts and professionals um and and i supported her and 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 i had a little chat with her but but i didn't i didn't step over that that line so you know what yes psychology is immensely important we know that pain is heavily related to 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 psychology we know that different people feel pain in different ways we know different people feel um benefit in different ways we know if two people hit their elbow on the same wall at the same time at the same speed at the same angle one person might have pain for two weeks and one person might have pain for two minutes um so so we know there's a big psychological element to pain um and uh, i think there's benefit in understanding that um uh, and, and 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 looking at the, the holistic person without without crossing the line into what professionals do that's answer gary would you like to step in there Yes, I would. I think on our price list, we should have counselling 20 quid extra on the bottom because we are all counsellors, aren't we? We, Like Tim was saying, we do talk to people about how they're getting on in life, what the stresses are. The only thing where I would probably disagree with Tim is and we did this with um, we've got a, a safeguarding officer and, and somebody who works in suicide prevention is that, you know, if somebody does come into your clinic and they are suicidal, the advice given to us, and we can probably do the, you know, web chat on this, you know, for a whole session uh, is to, to, to use pretty frank language, you know, about are you intending to kill yourself? You know, that, that type of questioning, um, but also as well, depending on the age of the person, you know and this came up to one of our members and uh, it was a teenager who was discussing that and then we we what are our obligations if somebody comes in you know and we know the parent are we obliged to tell the parent do we have to seek permission you know so that's why we brought in our safeguarding policy and we've got our safeguarding officer um a lots of further education colleges do actually run level two counselling courses free of charge. So check with your local authority, your local college, because that's a good starting point. So you can understand possibly, you know, how to deal with people without going outside of your scope of practice. Um, yeah, that was all the notes that I made on that. <laughs> that's great. I think it's listening to you guys. I think it is, again, having the connections, being part of the circle, being able to refer these people on knowing who to contact and just having the confidence not to kind of just shrug it off or make a joke which is ill-advised or just do the wrong thing it's just having that experience to know what to do not to just ignore it because there might be it may well be a responsibility to safeguarding issues so and i think there's courses which can i mean james chapman next week will be very much um helping with that with mental health first aid and knowing how to react if either you or your patients you feel suffering some kind of mental um health condition knowing how to refer them on what to say what not to say and so on so yeah if we, Great if question. we go on if we go on from that a bit matt you know how did tim feel when somebody told them him that they were suicidal you know what protection do we as therapists have ourselves from dealing with that what if you one of your regular clients tells you that you know they've just been diagnosed with an incurable cancer how do we deal with that how do we protect ourselves and that's 
again one of the reasons we've got our safe space where people can come and, and speak to one of us about that um it's it's difficult you know it's you know i, I suppose as a soft tissue therapist um where we might have longer you know a, an hour's appointment as opposed to a 20 minute or a 25 30 minute appointment with a with a physiotherapist or a chiropractor etc we might be able to have longer conversations you know with our clients that we might build a, a different type of therapeutic alliance or relationship with them they might trust us you know enough to share that information it might be a way of them offloading because they can't discuss it with their family and and unfortunately we have to take that on board but if anybody does find themselves in a situation where something's happened they've been given some information they don't know how to deal with it send me a message if you remember you know the sta gary profile it's always monitored um so send me a message yeah i'd just like to add yeah gary is exactly right about that it, it is a safeguarding issue and and you do need to to um to consider that um it, in my situation we we I, I, I actually work in a multidisciplinary team where we've got psychologists on site doctors um um etc um but if you're alone and working on your own then um then uh, yeah, you you may need to um, have a, have a conversation about that. Okay, so wonderful advice. And again, and, and the talk. other thing is 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 a suicidal patient. At any time, you can advise them to go to A and E. So you can send a patient at any time, day or night, to A and E, and they will get support. So um, so if you're not sure what to do, and someone says to you, "I'm suicidal," you can send them straight to A and E and say, "I want to go to A and E." Um, this is if you're on your own, you haven't got a, a, a team that's with you um, and, uh, and you get that person help straight away. That's good to know. Yeah, excellent. OK, and as, as I was going to say, um, yeah, we'll put all these links um, in here. We're going to have a massive um, show notes links here. And also, again, just to shout out, I mean, guys with mental health issues and the kind of we know that there's less uh, of an inclination for guys to share issues then. On February the 28th, we will have Ryan Smith and Jack Howard, who are the creators and hosts of Let's Be Frank podcast, which is exactly devised for to create that safe space for, for men uh, to talk and speak out um, about their life struggles and things. So it's 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 um, the whole of our month is going to be focusing on this. So right, just, be, just before we move on, just just before Nikki's put on their map, mental health first aid at work courses teach signposting for the yellow and red flag scenarios. Just before we move on. Excellent, yeah. And that'll be James next week. James Chapman will be talking exactly about that. So thanks, Nikki. Right, next question. Um, have I brought it up? Yes. Should I advertise sports massage? Now, this question came um, a little bit more context I'll give you now. Um, I've noticed a drop in interest since I removed sports massage from marketing and started pushing soft tissue therapy and pain management, etc. Should I change back to calling it sports massage? This is a great question because I think it's quite topical. Um, therapists wanting to explain more about what they offer and what they do but as this person this therapist has said they're, they're losing business mr allardyce what do you think uh, yeah I, I think one of the things that we need to um first of all understand is is about keywords and searching and how people find us you know people use google and people put keywords into google and if you are ranking well in popular keywords you're likely to get more people going onto your website and finding you um, and so, you know, people are more likely to search for words like massage rather than soft tissue therapy. And so there may be a, a, a little bit of a difference on, on, on how you, um, what you call yourself, but how you advertise yourself might be, might be different again. So I think it's important to understand the keywords and, and, the, and the things that your customers will be looking for. Um, and, and then that can kind of direct your your marketing or your AdWords or your website keywords or the articles you put on your blog. Um, yeah, very cool. I mean, I've been experiment, and it has been a social media uh, experiment with TikTok, playing around with TikTok. I've actually been talking to my shout out to my thirteen year old nephew, who's been teaching me things I had no idea about, but. The whole thing about hashtag we imagine that you put a hashtag in because that's what someone's going to click in to search for it but nowadays with with instagram reels with TikTok adverts whether and facebook where there's an algorithm the main reason for you putting that hashtag in there is not because someone's going to click that into search it's because if you've got it in there then whether it's um like i say TikTok or facebook reels they're going to grab your yeah. whatever you put together and put it out there more 
they're yeah. looking for these keywords which really turned it around for me and made me think so it's not that you're expecting someone to do a search on run or runner or running and you feel stupid putting those hashtags in but when you do a search on a website what are the most common hashtags for the algorithms to chuck your adverts out they run runner and running and it doesn't look nice to somebody who's interested in their business and investing their time but it's worth doing a search now if you're playing around with algorithms if you're making something spending time advertising to get it out there that's just my two bit of what i've learned this week i could give you a really good example if you wanted mm. to create a website you know you, you, you could call it your village name and then massage or your village name and soft tissue therapy and the thing is people search for massage so more likely to hit onto your website with the hashtags you know people search on social media for, for, for massage and actually like you say they get categorized into into people that have an interest in massage so somehow your posts will find their way due to the extraordinarily complex algorithms um, into the into people's inboxes that have an interest in massage um, and you probably already noticed this on t on TikTok and other social media videos come up that that actually have a bit of a massage element if you're in this industry and I know they do on mine um, so yeah it's, it's it's really about um, about attacking the right keywords that actually can generate business and revenue for you it's amazing and even songs even sounds now are part of the algorithm I was wondering why are the people all using these songs well they've yeah. got the same song in the background because even if you've got it very faint in the background again that gets picked up with the algorithm they're playing this song loads of people are listening to this song chuck it out there and you'll get more views it's crazy well, yeah. we will be doing we'll yeah. definitely do some episodes on marketing and advertising because it's a new world out there it's it's crazy on that matt on thursday mm. night in the sta members group we are, are hosting a zoom meeting with a google expert where we're going to be looking at uh, meta tags and, and marketing and analytics so that's thursday night this thursday night the 9th of february at 8 p.m zoom link is in the members area but just a couple of things here um massage if you just put massage in you the, there will be some algorithms out there that send you the wrong type of person and i was asked to review somebody's website the other day because they were getting a high rate of questionable callers so i said let me have a look at your website and it was I'll, I'll make the names up you know katie's massage services the picture of katie was a very attractive made up you know young lady um the and the it was just about massage services and work the the blurb was about working from a home-based clinic and altogether to me that they were three red flags you know if you're going to put a photograph of yourself you have it in your work uniform or you're you know you're running over the finish line of a you know tough mudder race or something um the massage services i i suggested it was changed to soft tissue therapy um and exactly like tim said the marketing is still sports massage but the website is soft tissue therapy um and, and then the third one was not advertising your work from a home-based clinic where you might be vulnerable or on your own. So there are a couple of things. Then the other thing about hashtags, and I put something in the in our uh, Facebook group yesterday, I believe, um, there is a lot of controversy with hashtags being used in marketing. And so I've spoken to HCPC about this. Um, there is a, a review that's happening later this year, and there is gonna be some, some enforcement rules, shall we say. But generally speaking, if, you, if you're writing a blog, on running injuries and you put a hashtag of physio and you're a sports therapist or a, a soft tissue therapist and you put a hashtag physiotherapy or hashtag physical therapy then there is an inference that the blog is useful for all of these professions that you're hashtagging however if you put if you've got a achilles tendinopathy you know booking at my clinic hashtag soft tissue therapy hashtag sports therapy hashtag physiotherapy then there is an inference that you are providing physiotherapy services so the use of the hashtag has to be really specific to to the needs and you can't use or infer the use of a protected title or protected services very interesting great advice yeah and they do the rounds don't they we've heard from various therapists who have been contacted great okay right one one thing before we move on Matt, a really yep. good point that was put in one of our chat professional discussions on our web on our facebook today was um from gary greenhill and he said i think it was gary 
Um, he put in there because Facebook algorithms change your um, categorization from time to time. So if you are linked in with hashtag physiotherapy, your medical and health or your massage services categorization may change to physiotherapy without your knowledge. So what he suggested was periodically and, and put it in your diary. So the 1st of March, the 1st of June, the 1st of September, the 1st of December, take a screenshot of your Facebook profile or your social media profile and then you can demonstrate that you're monitoring it and if it does change without your knowledge then at least you can say well I'm not doing this this is Facebook doing this and here's the record of what uh, uh, and, and you know a chronological record of what I've been doing so that I thought that was a really useful trick yeah great tip because yeah Facebook does change it uh, you get messages down there should this person change their their title and if someone says yes then they'll change it around yeah yeah great advice guys really good okay right um let me change what's on the screen at the moment q a we're going to question five this is kind of linked in nicely to what we were talking about before as in staying within the the realms of your scope of practice so are we qualified to give exercise advice the question was soft tissue therapists therapists are being urged to include more exercise based advice what are the positives of this and what are your concerns if you have any around this fairly new acquired scope i'll kick off on that then oh yeah for sure. uh, so I, I definitely ask gary to give the official line on this but my view is fairly straightforward and um, that, that if it's within your scope of practice and you've Oh, we just lost 10 I'll, I'll fill in. Gary, you step in. <laughs> I'll just fill in there. So if it's in your scope of practice and you have an exercise-based qualification, then you are qualified and insured as long as you've added it to your, um, your insurance policy. Um, if you are not appropriately qualified, my best advice is to use something along the lines of Rehab My Patient software, which is ex exquisitely designed where you can just, you know, I'm just bigging you up here, Tim. Just so oh, I'm, thanks. Uh, <laughs> you can use Rehab just... My Patient, select the exercises you perceive to be the ones of benefit to the client and give them or send them the exercise sheets or, or the programme. But officially, if you're prescribing exercise, you should be qualified to do so. Yeah. So um, my, my view is, is that um, you see exercise prescribed at all levels, um, you know, um, dad's on the side of a of a of a rugby field giving coaching to the under 10s you know you do these stretches warm up um i i think if you've got the knowledge of it and you you've had some some experience or training in it then then it's 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 fine to do it um if you have if you know nothing about it then don't don't just give exercises without any knowledge of why you're giving the exercise or or, or the reasoning behind a particular exercise um, I think so. You've got to have a little bit of knowledge on it, a little bit of training on what what it's doing. But then again, it's not that difficult um, to uh, to have a basic understanding of exercise prescription. Um, I, I think that Rehab My Patient does make it easy because it kind of gives you the the answers. So you can kind of learn from softwares like this. So you kind of see exercises for the hamstrings or for for the quadriceps, and then you decide, well, do I want to stretch the quadriceps or do I want to strengthen the quadriceps? And so you can find, you know, you find the stretches for quadriceps and and, and and that comes down to your principles you know and the principles are usually as straightforward as if it's if it's short lengthen it if it's tight stretch it if it's weak strengthen it if it's hypermobile stabilize it you know if it's unstable stabilize it you know these are you know it, these are kind of sort of principles of, of how you might sort of bring a body back to balance if you like um so yeah i think you know do, do prescribe exercise if you've got a bit of <laughs> thanks becky um, do subscribe, very, very loyal, very loyal uh, customer, Becky. Thank you for subscribing. Becky um, just said the comments on the screen. Listen to the podcast. Becky Carroll says, "I love rehab my patient. My clients find it super easy and professional. <laughs> it's not a plant, honestly." That's I have to is. screenshot that. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Well, what I will add to that, Matt, though, it, I don't think there's any harm. It, you know, let's just say Brian's mentioned question five. I think this is relevant to this um mm -hmm. what about a, a level three sports massage therapist let's say the level three sports massage therapist is a decent athlete you know they've they've taken part in mobility programs and and, and stretching regimes over the years i don't think there's any harm in saying to a client you know if i've got a tight lower back this is the exercise that i do and i find it super helpful 
why not give it a go and let me know next time how it's how it's affected you but also there are people like on on facebook and i am an advocate of, of of tagging people in so people like primal movement solutions who's a remedial instructor in the in the royal marines he put some really good videos on and so if you've got somebody with medial tibial stress syndrome shin splints that he might have a self-help video and when the client leaves say, so i'll tell you what i'll do I'll, I'll send you a, a link to my rehab my patient exercise software but i'll also send you a link to a, a self-help video you can do from primal movement solutions i don't think there's any harm in that at all rather than you know moving outside of our remit and and, and prescribing exercises when we're not qualified to do so great stuff um let's bring up nikki as well why not i'm not I'm not doing this purely for Tim's ego, but Nikki Mansfield says, I love we have my patient too. Always being updated and added to top notch and uber professional um, output to clients. There you go. A lot of love in the room for we have uh, my patient. Cool. Uh, right. I want to sort of a bit of a caveat as well, a bit of a get out clause um, <laughs> is to say, um, you know, just to stop any exercise that might cause discomfort. So, yeah. you know, don't don't push through the pain um you know there's so many you see so much crazy things on 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 social media with influencers doing you know so jumps into single leg romanian deadlifts into squats into you know into this and that you know they do these mm -hmm. crazy routines which are just not realistic for 99 percent of people out there um and and that's all over social media um i think if you if you do prescribe keep it simple um make it re realistic for your patient um advise them to stop if they get any pain um mm. if you're not sure then then post online get some help get some support because there's loads of people that jump out and go do you know what we'll give you some advice on that definitely and make a note probably like you say on your notes i'd advise to progress slowly and stop if just get it on there on your notes just in case something does happen and they yeah. get we some put, advice put it as default on all the exercise yeah. programs on, on rmp yeah, interesting it doesn't matter how yeah. professional we are and what advice that we give if you're working with a running athlete dave at the running club is always the font of knowledge so <laughs> you go and ask him Brilliant. right let's squeeze another one in because we can let's bring up a question the final question for tonight because it is already 8 54 and um, where are we going to be on question six? Oh, this is kind of a link into it anyway so yeah why not um, the shortened version on the screen is favorite home exercises for patients. The full question was, what are some of your favorite home exercises for patients who aren't into gym traditional weight training to encourage buy-in slash motivation, fun factor, meaningfulness? It depends on the purpose of what you're trying to prescribe the exercise for. Depends on the type of person you're prescribing the exercise for. Is it an older person at a, at a, at a housebound? Um, so if it's an older person, I would give um, chair-based exercises, for example, simple standing exercises or sitting exercises or lying exercises, things like sit to stands, um, straightening your leg when sitting in a chair, um, um, standing next to a wall and lifting your leg to the side, like a like a hip abduction exercise, you know, things like that. So, I, so if it, if it was an, so, it, it depends on 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 your on your person that you're prescribing it to um and and um and the purpose of why you're prescribing exercise if you want to get strong at home you want to let's say you want to build some core strength or stability then we can give body weight exercises like um four point kneeling exercises planks press up hold exercises swiss ball exercises where you you know plank on a swiss ball bridges things like that so so it depends on the purpose of what you're trying to achieve if you you know, if your patients really or, or, or clients are really keen on um, on they want to stretch everything, maybe foam roller exercises. Um, you know, you may want to give some foam roller or, or maybe they want to massage it or self massage it, maybe some spiky ball exercises. So I think establish what it is you're trying to achieve. What's the purpose of prescribing the exercise and, and know your patient as to who you're dealing with to di direct the type of exercise you might give. This Very this nice. is this is probably my favourite because this is what I used to teach. 
Um, I'd look at overcoming barriers, you know, and, and the use of equipment, for example. Um, you can achieve so much with a rolled up towel and a, a broom handle and a, and a, a, you know, a milk container full of water. But it's specificity. You know, what are you prescribing the exercise to do? How do you explain that? Have you demonstrated progression and regression? But if even if you don't understand all of that, what you can do is tell your client, you know, that, let's hypothesize they've come in for a, a restricted shoulder movement, which they say is a frozen shoulder. You've done some soft tissue work, some mobilizations. What I would say to them is when you get up in the morning, I'd like you to investigate how your shoulder can move. And I'd like you to move it in a way that you haven't moved it today. And I'd like you to make a note of the results. And, and if you go into a range of movement, whether it's an over, you know, a sort of head on the work surface and pendulum swinging side to side or circles, let you know, make a mental note of where it becomes uncomfortable. And I want you to keep going to that point of discomfort, but I don't want you to go past that point of discomfort. And what you will notice is that as you investigate that movement more and more, that restriction will move. So it will become more comfortable to move past that point. And so just get up in the morning, investigate movement. Tomorrow morning, investigate something that you haven't done today and try and get them interested in understanding how movement can, can make life easier for them. Very nice, wonderful. Yeah, I like that. It's great, isn't it? It, it reminds me um, of Chris Tiley's video therapy expo with the old guy. Chris Tiley, if you're not sure, if you're looking at exercise, different ideas, and make sure you follow Chris Tiley, never told to lift. Um, but yeah, his video, remember with the guy who neighbors were looking at who was lifting things out kind of in front of him, doing his exercises three times a day and everything. People are going, he's told to do that. And then the last shot is Christmas with his granddaughter coming and running in the door and he lifts her up so she can put the star oh, I'm choking up just thinking about it but so he lifts up his granddaughter so he can she can put the star on top of the tree which is why he was doing all these exercises and that always makes me think talk to your client what is it they'd love to be doing why are they getting stronger why do they feel they need to get stronger what is it they want to do and once you got that then you can increase the chance of them doing the exercises by linking it in with that, showing them how they're climbing that ladder of ability until they do manage to, whatever it is, whether they feel they're gonna, it's gonna make their life happier. So good old Chris Tiny. Yeah, and, and making it fun. You mm, know, that's, exactly. that's half the battle, isn't it? That we don't want to 20 minutes out of our day doing something that's boring. But if we make it fun and somewhat competitive, if you do this with your partner, you might be doing some balancing exercises, stand on one leg, you know, eye closed or, you know sensory deprivation or something but make it competitive how long can you stand there compared to your partner just make it fun and interesting uh, thanks brian for That's liking fine. my classes i appreciate your support mate <laughs> great stuff gas always like your classes mate sweet as <laughs> sweet becky cowles with a nice uh, mention as well becky it's a great comment from you i find video consultations that allow you to see into the client's home pays dividends with home exercise prescription definitely that was a one of the kind of things we learned from COVID, wasn't it? Being able to see the client getting mm. to do it in their house. Them going, I can't do this, there's a table in the way. And then actually really giving them something they can physically do or use. Yeah, that's very good, Becky. Good shout. Right. The time has beaten us. It's nine o'clock. That zoomed through, didn't it? Are we going to do this every week or every month? Or do you think, um, I think it's going yeah, to be Let's do it, yeah, yeah Tim. Yeah. Do it, yeah. The pilot episode has come to an end. Then. <laughs> well, you should get feedback first and see if people found it useful. Well, we'll see. I mean, I know Net I'm meeting with Netflix next week at uh, some point to see um, whether they think this is going to be a regular thing on Netflix. But we'll see. For the moment, it'll be on the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel. Um, it goes out live. Netflix, you know, they, get, they must be knocking the doors down for this sort of content. But I've got a meeting, okay? So I'm going to step through the door and we'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have a little chat about it. But anyway, yeah. So yeah, if you listen to the podcast, thank you very much. Obviously, um, it makes all the difference. The, the downloads are still coming through thick and thin, um, which is lovely. I do stress again, if you could leave a rating and a review, that makes all the difference, obviously, because it just helps us. Again, it's, mar it's not marketing; it's not selling it, but it just helps get the great information which our guests um, give us for free out there which is what this is all about what the sports therapy association is all about raising standards in our industry so um yeah if you enjoy this episode then you might want to join us live first tuesday of the month where tim and i will be back um for the rest of the month 
as I said before at the opening, we're going to have a focus on mental health and learning disabilities. And we'll be starting that off on Tuesday, February the 14th next week uh, with our guest James Chapman of allaboutthemind.com. So you are welcome to join us there. If not, then look out for us, uh, follow us wherever you can, share the word and uh, take care of each other. And those of you joining in the live lounge, thank you very much for making it. I very much doubt this would continue if we didn't have people joining us live. So it's lovely. It just gives us all a buzz and it's fun. So thank you for joining us, um, people. You too, Tim, Gary, thank you very much. You too. That's a bit kind of like, yeah. Not Thanks, man. Like. Thanks for hosting. You too. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Stick around so we can just have a little chat after I close it down. Um, and can, I, yeah. can, I just, can I just say, Matt, that Definitely, I'd like yeah. to to personally thank Tim for his generous support of the STA members over the years and for giving up his valuable time when he's as busy as he as he is and and we're keeping away from that psychology degree I, I fear no. but um, <laughs> look at because we are doing this more is way more fun though <laughs> and, yeah, Tim and I have got some some good ideas for Therapy Expo and there is an initial meeting next week next Wednesday where we'll be discussing that but uh, yeah hopefully uh, Tim will be more involved with our conference again this year um, so um, watch the space oh, beautiful and we'll end it there take care everybody thanks guys take care lovely to see you all cheers